All right. Hey everyone, hope you're having a good middle of the week. I'd like to thank Kira for being here with me today and also Joshua Huffmaster, uh, master trainer extraordinaire, all those sort of stuff there. Always give you compliments yeah, all the time. Yeah. You give Where them, are my compliments? Yeah, I was going to say, Kira's being left out on the compliments. I'm married to you. Is, you is should it, give me more. Isn't that a compliment enough? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> oh, guys, I'm in trouble. Can we trade seats over here real quick? <laughs> yeah, All right, yeah. guys, welcome here. We're glad to have this show today because I want to talk about pairing, pairing. But let me kind of walk down that trail just a little bit because what does it do? What does pairing allow us to do with our dogs? What does it do for us? Number one word, control. There's nothing like it. And there's nothing worse than feeling like you have no control. That's why I'm such a big fan. I love the uh, poem by English poet William Ernest Henley, Invictus, in which he writes, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. There is nothing like being in control. Uh, I remember my days in the military. It was tough. A lot of the training was very hard. Uh, the instructors were not very nice, but I smiled anyway. Uh, the training was difficult, and I didn't want to do all the things that they told me to do, but I did them anyway. Why? Because I was in control of my fate. I adopted the strategy, smile, cooperate, and graduate. And by golly, that's how it got done. We can all handle good news, bad news, and different news if we know we have some semblance of control. But by golly, there's nothing worse than not having control. Imagine driving up to an intersection and the light turns purple. I don't know about you guys. I'd freak. I'm just going to be honest with you right now. I wouldn't know what I would do. Cars are coming up behind me. They're all approaching the intersection. I'm thinking, do they have a purple light or only does Brian have the purple light? I'm the only joker out here that has the purple light. What do you do with a purple light? Exactly. Absolutely. Yes. Are you sure that was a portobello mushroom? <laughs> <laughs> well, CBD. We did have a little radio show about yeah. that. There's nothing wrong with a little CBD. But uh, so again, we would feel out of control. Well, I'm telling you, you will never have control of anything without pairing. So what is pairing? Pairing really is nothing more than taking sensory input. All day, every day, your brain receives thousands of data input, your, your sight. What do you see? How many things do you think you see in a day? How many things do you hear? How many things do you smell? How many things touch you or how many things do you touch? All of that data wouldn't mean anything, wouldn't mean a thing at all if you had not interpreted it and you would not have interpreted it if you didn't have a referent with a specific outcome attached to it. Uh, case in point, back to our red lights again and our intersections, red light, uh, it had an outcome. You're supposed to stop your car. I can interpret that. So I do that action. Um, same thing with the green light. The light turns green. Uh, I want to go unless something overrides that. Pairing is what makes that happen. And pairing goes heavily, heavily with semiotics. Semiotics is how animals operate. They don't have language. When you don't have language, you have to rely upon 
we're saving signals. And now again, you're in control. Anytime I receive a signal, if I come in the day and Joshua says, good morning, Brian. Well, I'm in control. I could either return a good morning, just nod my head, high five, whatever. I'm in control. So anyone who receives a signal is always in more control than the person or the animal sending the signal. But all that being said, it's part of semiotics and part of semiotics requires not only the signal, whether you respond to it or not, but you have to be able to interpret it. And if you, if you can interpret the signal, then there's a reason why you can't. And that's called the referent. The referent is the huge anchor. And for those of you who are tuned in uh, live today, as soon as I can manage to work my little gadgets here, I'm going to go ahead and hop up on a screen here that we have in our radio room. And I'm going to doodle because I love to doodle. Uh, it's what I, I do all the time. It helps me think and get through things. So let me just kind of draw something for you. We have a signal. Okay. So I tell a dog, for example, the first time ever, come, come. So that's my signal to the animal. Well, at that moment, if the dog has never heard come, it'd be like me looking over here, Joshua and saying, scuba knock. Excuse me. Exactly. So there we go. He, well, he says that with words that he should know, but anyway, I understand <laughs> why he doesn't say it with scuba knock. I get the word, excuse me. Of course. Why? Because there's a dotted line between the signal and the interpreted. There's no relationship at all existing. So my job would have to be to make sure he understood what the scuba dog mean. And you as the dog owner has to make sure that the dog understands what does come mean? What does come mean? So of course, what you would do is say the word come and make your dog come back to you using long line, whatever method you want to. But the dog goes from point A to point B. So now just below my triangle, I'm going to write S1, signal one. Signal one's job is to evoke a response from the dog. R1, signal one equals R1, response one, back to signal one. And that means come to me, come back to me off of the signal, come. Once I do that, then two lines will immediately form. The dotted line that goes between the interpreter and the referent suddenly become very solid lines. Very solid. Okay. Why? Because now there is a correlation between the command and the outcome, the sensory input, whether you're waving your arm in your directions and Hey, fight over here, come you're bending over. Like a lot of people do. You're slapping your legs, you're clapping your hands, you're whistling, you're clucking, whatever. All of those become stereotyped. And because they're stereotyped, they always come with this outcome of coming back to you. That, that's called pairing. And pairing happens two ways, either naturally, a natural pairing, or a directed or intended pairing. That's what we do. Dog on its own may not understand what come means. In fact, it actually goes against the grain with dogs from a natural standpoint. Why would I bother to come to you if I'm on a hunt? What's the benefit for me? Uh, but here we are, furless bipeds, and we say, come. We have to make the dog come back to us. When it does, we've now established over a period of time, over a certain amount of repetitions, we have interpretation. So now we have a solid line between the signal. I understand it. And why do I understand it? Because Brian has made me do it 500 times, which means under those conditions, under those conditions, meaning if you practice at a park, you practice in your backyard, you practice at a training facility, under those conditions, I have a referent, the good old referent, the cornerstone of all learning. So here's where I'm going with this. If you guys, you will use pairing just so you know, whether you like it or not, whether you intend it to or not, pairing comes naturally. But here's what you must understand. We humans can rationalize. We've made other pairings outside of the intended pairing that you're trying to accomplish by, by maybe teaching me how to say a certain word understand a certain, how to do a certain action when you give me a certain signal, so on and so forth. But because pairing happens all the time, our dogs 
when they receive intended pairing, the, once again, I go back to my example, come to me when I call you. We do this. We have to now do the exact same thing. Call the dog, whatever technique you use to make the dog come back to you. You must do that exact same thing under all of the conditions and locations and environments and times and so on and so forth that you want the dog to come to you. Otherwise, we see it here all the time, Joshua. They don't make the association. But we humans think, hmm, you know, I taught my dog to come. So I've been practicing in my backyard and he comes to me every single time. But then all of a sudden there's this big scratch of the head, big disappointment when suddenly you take your dog to the dog park and you say, come and the dog doesn't. Well, again, there could be other mitigating circumstances, meaning the other dog took priority over you, but that's what's happening. There's no referent. There's no pairing. I've never been given the command come while I was at a dog park. And if there's no referent people is game over. The line between the referent and the sign between that on the bottom line on the triangle is now dotted or doesn't exist at all. And we call that conceptual distance, meaning I don't get it. Maybe it's a little hazy, maybe a little foggy. Maybe I have some idea, but don't count on your dog reliably responding to you unless you have made the animal pair every time. Absolutely. And I think one thing that is, that needs to be really kind of nailed home is the fact that, like you mentioned, this is going to happen whether you want it to or not intentionally or unintentionally. And just as an example, you know, there's, we, I had a client the other day that brought their dog in and they were wondering why when they call their dog, their dog actually runs from them. And I said, well, where does this take place? Well, our backyard. Okay. Have you ever played a game of chase where you were the chaser? Yeah. And you're actively trying to get the dog. Well, the dog has interpreted you engaging the dog in a, in a game of chase. <laughs> and they don't, you know, you don't realize that until somebody kind of breaks it down to you that, yeah, it may be frustrating to you, but let's think about the dogs for a second. This is super fun. <laughs> I just play a little getaway. And, and so whether you want to pair that or not, it happens. You just have to make sure that the, the referent is the same consistently intentionally in order to get the response that you want. Absolutely. The referent is everything. We see this in so many cases. I mean, think about us. If I rub my hand across this tabletop right now and something hurts, something hurts my hand right then. I go, ow, oh my gosh. I'm not going to look at Joshua and go, why'd you do that? The first thought that's <clears throat> going to come to my mind because of natural pairing is what was on the table. What did I, did my hand make contact with that caused that pain? So natural pairing occurs with or without your influence. So you, when you train, whether you train a human or you train a dog, your job is to make sure that you create an intended pairing. And the only way you're going to do that is to have a solid referent. Have I done it before? We see this with dogs doing stay. Oh, Brian, my dog stays. I just had a client yesterday. Oh my gosh, he does so good. He does so good with place. He gets on his cot. He loves his cot. He stays. Well, until the doorbell rings. All right. Have you practiced doing place with the doorbell ringing? No. Well, then what did you expect? Right. Again, we humans with our higher cognition think, well, I trained it. He's got it. No, he doesn't. You're a human. You would have it. You would, you would know this. You would be able to have that explained to you. You could read that, surf the internet, and all sorts of things. But your dog can't. In their world, sensory input governs an action from them. It motivates an action. They do something from that sensory input. They go up to a porcupine and think, wow, I'm hungry. That thing's moving on four legs. Therefore, it must be food. Mm -hmm. But then they learn through their own self-discovery, through cause and effect, that, oh my God, that hurt. That hurt really bad. Well, now guess what? The single is, or the symbol is the shape of a porcupine. 
you could have anything after that point. You could just have a big old stuffed porcupine out there. And, and we've done this. We've done this in, in testing with wolves and found out that they just back off. I don't have anything to do with that. Why? Because my interpretation was pain. It hurt. And the referent was only took one time. And that's another rule as well. There's a mathematical formula to this. The greater the intensity of the stimulus that, that uh, attaches itself, whether it be pain or whether it be something frightening, the, the greater that is, the, mes the less amount of repetition required to learn. The same thing with humans. I mean, again, how many times do you need to stick your tongue in an outlet to learn? Uh, not a good choice of, of behaviors at the moment. Not a good action. Yeah. And, and going back to the you know improper pairing, what I call superstitious behavior, how you were kind of talking about you touch the table, something burns you, you're not going to blame it on me. But that does happen with dogs. They can, like I said, what I call superstitious behavior, where they pair it with something that was completely unassociated with the event. Uh, case in point, a dog that I worked with years ago um, developed a, a slight fear of wind because there was a situation in which that the window was open in the house, a big gust of wind uh, take, took place, and it knocked over a broom onto the dog and kind of smacked it on the butt. Well, it, it paired nothing with the fact that the broom happened to accidentally fall and hit him on the butt, and it was nothing to worry about. It was any time the wind picked up from that point on, the dog freaked because they thought the, the wind was going to get them, completely unassociated with the event. Yeah, I write about this all the time, you know, and I deal with it with pharmacotherapy in which we have animals who are become paranoid and who associate certain things. And I write about the sad story of Elsie, which turned out to be a happy ending, but in the beginning, she for seven years would run to a closet, a certain closet in the hallway anytime there was a thunderstorm and she, that's where she would go. And of course, from a natural event, the thunderstorms finally went away, but she paired the inside of the closet with the action of the thunderstorms going away. So unfortunately, after seven years of doing this, there was an occasion in which no one was home. The closet door was shut. Thunderstorm rolled in about two o'clock in the morning. And she was bound and determined to get in that closet. And she broke her skull, her zygomatic bone underneath her left eye. She ripped out three teeth, several sutures. But by golly, she got into that closet. She went right through the sheetrock to get in there. And the sad thing is, is that there were three other closets that she could have gone into. The doors were wide open, beds to get under, bathtubs to get in, tables to crawl under. But no, no, that closet, that closet is what makes thunderstorms go away. That closet, no other closet will do. And that's called pairing. Yeah. And unfortunately, that hit, that ended up being an intended pairing that, that kind of dovetailed off of a natural pairing right. uh, because the owners, having tried everything, not realizing that, wow, we, we might need to use chemicals with this animal, didn't realize that. They didn't know that there was such a thing as pharmacotherapy for dogs. They, they enabled the action of this by simply keeping the closet door open. I said, fine. Now she has a safe haven to go to when thunderstorms occur. And that's, uh, and that's how it developed. Uh, so anyway, guys, we're going to take a short break and then we come back, we're going to finish up the pairing. And then we have some news that we need to put out here real quickly because there are dogs dying from swimming in lakes. And you need to know about that because summertime and everyone wants, wants to go on the lake. And then we have some questions that have come in from a lot of the viewers. And if you have any, send them to us right now. But we're going to go ahead and take a couple minute breaks and then we get back. We'll ro keep rolling here. All right. Yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and finish up with the pairing when we come back. And then we'll go into the other stuff. Yeah, we have an additional question as well. Okay. Good deal. Hey, didn't you used to tell that story about the the long neck goose and the hawk? Conrad Lorenz, the hawk and goose theory. Absolutely. That's the same thing, isn't it? it yes, uh, it is. No, really not. Actually not. Uh, yes and no. no. Yes and no. Explain it to us in two minutes. Again, that's me. <laughs> all, <laughs> all these layers always travel down. I always go down 50 million rabbit holes. We're, the the what that the study instinct. proved that is that, instinct. yes, that okay. they were born, that the goose or the, the shape was a sign stimuli, which again, that's right so back here. So the parent had paired it. No. It's no, a genetic. No, they had, 
the animal itself, the species had made that pairing mm -hmm. long ago. And it was such a strong pairing because it was a survival innate. thing. Yes. Okay. It actually became the DNA, the thing that influences your behavior. And that's why the test was done with these young ducklings and goslings, because they wanted to make sure that there had been no intended pairing by mm -hmm. the parents. I see. So mm -hmm. they simply acted on out of instinct. And, well, and then, so another interesting study that I'll, I'll try to find and pull up and, and put on our Facebook or YouTube is the, where they took mice and they basically created these mice to have a phobia of the smell cherry by, you know, electric shock and things like that. And through, it took four generations before the offspring never having any association with cherry flee to the scent of cherry. Oh. So it only took four generations for that to take place naturally through instinct. That is so fast. Yeah. Well, that's what happens when you have a really quick turnover. Yeah. yeah. You know, all these studies with humans and human behaviors and things uh, occurring through uh, what we call genotypic type variations and so on and so forth, they just take longer. You know, your average human is living over 70. Okay, guys. Welcome back, everyone. We were talking about pairing before we went away on break. And Kira uh, brought up something uh, for those of you that are just on the radio. She asked me, there was a study, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Conrad Lorenz, a famous ethologist, but not so famous as a household name. You'd have to kind of be into that stuff like I am. But he, he performed a study many years ago known as the Hawk and Goose Theory, in which a silhouette was uh, manually flown above the heads of young ducklings and goslings. And it was to determine, was there intended pairing by the ducklings and goslings' parents, or was this already innate? And the, the way the, uh, the silhouette was drawn was that if they pulled it or flew it over the heads of these ducklings and goslings in a certain direction, it resembled a long-tailed hawk. And without any sort of intended pairing being taught by their parents, they closed their eyes and froze. And then when the shape came back the other direction, it took on the semblance of a long neck goose. And now all of a sudden they opened their eyes and their mouths are wide open and they're making all sorts of sounds. And that became known as a sign stimuli, which is again, part of the semiotic triangle shapes. Dogs can tell the shape of another animal. I use stuffed dogs as part of as my pre-evaluation to determine if we have any sort of mental disorders with dogs in, in part their interpretation of what a dog is and how a dog behaves. And even though these dogs have no dog smell other than they've been licked a few times and a couple of them have been bitten a few times by other dogs, they, they don't have, they're not given any sort of outward other signs or, sim, or signals. They're just take on the silhouette of a dog, but they immediately react to that. So again, it, it's so important to understand that pairing when we're training our dogs, couple of rules. Number one, it takes time. Unless the intensity is very high, it won't take time, but that should be reserved for those behaviors that could be very dangerous or very destructive around the household case in point. If you just have a bad habit of putting your medications up on your kitchen counter or chocolate or whatever, and you have a dog who counter serves, well, now you can put a scat mat up there, turn it on high. You can use our- Hold that. We have a question. This That's one of our questions. That's one of our questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So meaning that example. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, then well, well the counter surfing, how to stop well, the counter surfing. Well, there we go then. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I want to- Kill two birds with one stone. Okay, go ahead. Not a long-tailed <laughs> hawk or a long-necked goose, but I'm going to go ahead and just answer that darn thing. All right, so there you go. So you got this dog. Okay, remember, natural pairing and intended pairing. Okay, in this case in point, in obedience, where I'm giving the signal, I say come, I wave, I do this, this, or that. However, in this particular situation, I prefer that natural pairing occur. So there, there is no association with me. That guarantees that the dog won't do the behavior, whether I'm home or not. Because if I step in a room and I go, no, bad dog, yank on a leash, what have you. Well, over a few times, because here's what's going to happen. Depending on how much of a cost that was, 
Most dogs are going to go back to the behavior because they assign a benefit to that counter. Oh, yeah, Brian yelled at me, but you know, there's still something really good up there. And I don't see Brian anywhere. So therefore they get on the counter and sure enough, nothing happens. But then all of a sudden the next day they do and I catch them and I say, no, then they get on there again and nothing happens. So of course, here we go. Now they've learned, you know, there's nothing dangerous about this counter at all. I've been, I've had my paws all over this thing. There's nothing dangerous. The only danger is Brian showing up. So that's the pairing that's made then. And that's the, not the pairing that you want. I didn't have anything to do with that. How about if we make the counter hot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why, again, like a scat mat would be great. And if you don't know what that is, just a little clear uh, mat that has little electric wires running through it, connected to a nine volt battery. Hear me, nine volt battery, not to an outlet in your house. Uh, it was originally designed to make cats go away. Try sneaking up on a cat that's on your counter. They hear you coming five miles away and they're already off. But it was designed for that. Now it's been modified for dogs. You can also use a remote caller. But no matter what you use, don't say a word. Try not to even look. And, I had nothing to do with that dog. And if at all possible, try not to even be present. Amen. A lot of these Face remote time. callers. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we had to do that with your dog, Moses. You notice I said, your dog, Moses? <laughs> Uh, Moses would get up on this big old kitchen island all the time. And when I first met Kara and I said, good Lord, how long has this been going on? Because the dog shredded my backpack that I had laying up there. She goes, oh, about six years. And I go, well, I'm going to make this go away in six minutes. Mm -hmm. And on with the remote training caller. And I said, throw the Twinkies up there. Throw this, throw that. I don't care what. Chocolate cake. There. Chocolate was the cake. the only dog who could eat chocolate cake and not. Well, he, he ate a sternal log and lived. True. So this dog could eat anything. But so we baited the dog. We got in the car. I said, I'm going to convince him we had nothing to do with this. So we got in the car. We're backing out of the driveway. Talk about that pairing I just mentioned about me being the dangerous thing or you being the dangerous thing. Oh, yeah. He's looking out the window. He was smart. Yeah. He was watching us back down the driveway. And, and then he's looking at the counter, looking out the window, looking back at the counter. And then all of a sudden we get to a certain point and we start to go forward out of the driveway. We're committed to actually leaving. There he goes. He didn't hesitate. His whole body flew about six feet in the air and he landed perfectly. I'd have scored him a 10 in gymnastics, <laughs> right dead smack in the middle of that counter. And by golly, that's when I pressed the button on the remote training caller. They don't make camera speed, <laughs> camera film or whatever that is, that's fast enough to capture his body flying out of that kitchen. And you know what? He never got on there again. He didn't. He was fixed. No, nope. natural pairing, baby. He there, didn't, you know. There's a benefit to having a healthy fear to things that could potentially be harmful to you. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a, a huge thing that a lot of clients will say, well, I don't want them to be afraid of the counter. And I go, why, why not? <laughs> but, why not? Yeah, you know, when, when you do bomb detection with the dog, you have to make sure that the dog is afraid of setting off that bomb. Period. Oh, amen. So amen. You're talking you, <laughs> you, you don't ever want to be behind the person diffusing a bomb. That's not afraid of the bomb, yeah. but the, you know, back to the counter is, is, there's potentially things, unless you are just the most conscious person I've ever met in my entire life, and you never put anything harmful to your dog on the counter, then the counter is potentially something harmful. And same thing goes for the trash. Yeah, but there's this chap called Murphy. He's very patient. <laughs> he will wait. And he will wait. And by golly, someone will. Because yeah. Kara was conscious of that. She knew there, there was a problem with her Doberman. I didn't know that. So I may kind of made a little bit light of it, but let me get a little bit serious here. The backpack that he shredded had Remedil, an entire bottle of Remedil, an anti-inflammatory for my dog. Well, that went down the hatch. Bottle and all. The bottle and all. Thank goodness, because that's exactly <laughs> how it came out the other end. Bottle and all. The luckiest dog in the whole wide world. Oh, no. Gosh. He oh, was yeah. so sweet. That could have killed him. That was a potentially fatal, and I owned a vet hospital for many years, and I can tell you one sad story after another of dogs dying from things that they ingested off of countertops, off of your sofa, the underwear that they picked up, you name it. There is a time for the health of your dog. I'm just not talking about your convenience, but to save your dog is for them to associate that the countertop has porcupine skin on it, yep. that my socks have our cacti, a pair of cacti laying, laying there. Although I'm very clean about cleaning up, but I'm a neat freak when it comes to that. But that being said, there's a time to do that. So I hope that answers that question there.
Yeah. But back to just a couple things, and we're going to wrap up on pairing. One, to pair anything with an outcome, those two things have to always be consistent. Hence, semiotics doesn't work without stereotyping both the signal and the outcome. So it's not enough just to always say come. You must make come happen every single time. You must set yourself up and set the dog up to succeed every single time. Otherwise, you change the referent. There's a time in which you call me with a long leash, but then you didn't. You just changed the semiotic triangle. The referent just changed. And now the dog does a different behavior. And if they discover something, hey, you know what? Actually going in the opposite direction, I was able to obtain the benefit of chasing a squirrel up the tree, which was much greater than the benefit that Brian has. Uh, so it will happen. So A, stereotype both the signal, stereotype the outcome. When you do that, you will have a solid signal to interpret it to referent triangle. And then make sure you do this very same thing under all of the conditions, all of them that you can possibly think of that you would need your dog to reliably respond to that command. And that's called intended pairing, which is what we do in obedience. You must do it like that. It takes a little bit of time. Takes a whole lot of patience, takes a whole lot of due diligence on your part. You got to roll your sleeves up and get after it. But if you do, here's the neat thing not only will you achieve your, your goals, your dog coming back to you when come, when you say the command come, you will achieve what's called a fixed action pattern. So go back to biology class or psychology class and get into Pavlovian theory. It's still around, guys, just so you know. It didn't die off, it's still there. This is a biological reflex to a given stimulus. So all of a sudden I say, come, the dog comes. And when it gets to me, it wonders, uh, what was I doing? Yep. What was I doing? That's a beautiful thing. Hence you hear the saying all the time, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, you can, but the problem that you're dealing with are those fixed action patterns. Absolutely. It's the, it's the repetition that, that matters. You have to have a number of repetitions that the dog draws that referent easily and quickly. And it becomes an automatic response. How many times... You know, after living at a, a certain location for a period of time, how many times do you drive from work to home and kind of go, I don't even remember the drive here. How did I get here? Traffic hypnosis. Yeah. <laughs> you drove to work the other day when we weren't even planning on coming here. You were just on autopilot. Yep, yep. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm also the kid that got up and got dressed and went to school on Saturday and realized <laughs> that it was Saturday after I got there. I'm not ashamed to admit you're, you're absolutely right. And that's how that occurs. Okay, guys, if you have any more questions about pairing at all, reach out to us. Reach out to Brian with a Y at TamingTheWild.com, to Joshua at TamingTheWild.com, or Kira, K-I-R-A at TamingTheWild.com. We will be glad to answer any questions or clear up any confusion you may have about pairing. Now, I want to move on to some hot news right now. And it's not hot just because it's summertime, but the heat has created this very lethal condition for dogs. Kara, tell us about, because I, I learned it from you. I didn't even know this existed until you brought it up. Well, I don't know all the scientific part of it. But I got that part. Yeah, you could take that. It's my understanding that dogs who swim in a lake that has this certain type of algae will die within like sometimes half an hour. They Absolutely. What she's talking about is called blue-green algae, and it's cyano, uh, cyanobacteria. So the first time I heard about cyanobacteria, I looked it up, did my little research. And, but right off the bat, I'm thinking cyanide, cyanide. Is there any correlation between cyanide and cyanobacteria? And by golly, yeah. there is. Cyanobacteria is a deriv uh, derivative of the word, the Greek word, kyanos, meaning dark blue. So apparently in nutrient rich lakes and ponds, which happens, of course, during the summertime, a bacteria can form in the lake that is equivalent, is every bit as lethal as cyanide. It's, uh, and it takes on the form of that pea green. I cannot tell you how many times, A, I've seen this. Mm -hmm. B, I've waited in that. Um, I, I guess I'm just but lucky to it, be alive. Uh, yeah, it doesn't. So just because you see that there doesn't mean that it's toxic. So there is, I mean, you'll see that same green, blue stuff 
but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not that it's toxic. It's actually less likely that it is toxic than it is. However, you just want to assume that anytime you see that it is toxic. Yeah. yeah I, well, think, I take the chance. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You have to take the old <clears throat> initial success or total right. failure standpoint <laughs> yeah. on that, because if it is toxic, it's toxic quickly. You can't even get to the vet in time. No, to, no. To if the help. dog yeah, ingests just even a few mouthfuls of that water, if it is toxic, if it has an, it has an anatoxin in it and an anatoxic from my research uh, results in neurotoxicity, meaning the first onset that happens quickly. In fact, an anatoxin is known as, has an acronym, DFDF. So I'm going, what the heck is BFDF? That sounds really bad. And it is. It stands for very fast death factor. Oh my gosh. Meaning without immediate aggressive intervention by your veterinarian. And even if you do, you're probably not going to pull through it. This will kill your dog within minutes. And they'll start off with twitching then muscle spasms, paralysis, and respiratory arrest. And they literally salivate to death. Uh, you basically, wow. you basically have to watch your dog consume the, the blue green algae, and then you have to know what the blue green algae is and then immediately rush it to the vet in order to have any level of success rate. Yeah. And you know, unless the pond is in your backyard and the vet's just around the corner, yeah. right? Yeah. How yeah, many people are going to get there? How many, the one family lost, how many dogs care? Four dogs. Good gosh. Four. Yeah. And what about 15 minutes? Less than half an hour. Imagine that. So guys, if you are right now, uh, you have a pond near you or a lake that you visit often with your dogs, watch out. If you see anything on the surface, you can go online. I even put a link to this on our website under the radio page. Uh, you can go on there and check it out yourself. It just green algae, but takes on a little a bluish tint. But you know, if you're wearing sunglasses, you may not notice that. Me, I'm not taking a chance, period. I, if there's anything green at all floating on top of a lake, there's my dog's just not going in. Yeah. In fact, I'll just wait for winter time. They don't mind yeah. if it's cold. I, you, you may, but they don't. But this stuff again is known as cyanobacteria. It's blue green in color. It looks like pea soup or a bunch of broccoli floating on top of the pond and it moves. The wind can shift it from side to side, making it very accessible to livestock, to pets, even to humans. So be careful. If your dog's been swimming in this, this is not the time to let it lick your face. Uh, this can be fatal and it has been fatal. And there's an incredible uprise in this across the country uh, that we've seen of that. So I'm, wow, it's all over the news now. I didn't know anything about this, honestly, which is very, until now. which is very interesting. You probably know more about it just from researching it since you've known about it, but it's actually something that's quite common from where I come from in Missouri it is probably a yearly thing every summer that, Oh, Hey, blue green algae alert, keep your dogs and stay out. Don't go swimming in ponds or lakes or anything for wow. a while until you get the all clear. Well, that's I've why it's known as it until this year. Yeah, yeah, but that's why it's known as misery. I mean, or Missouri, right? right. Missouri, <laughs> right. Yeah, Missouri, yeah, one of the two. There. Yeah, yeah. So watch out, guys. Uh, again, I posted a link on our website to you can go look up information on it yourself. Blue green algae. That's all you have to type in. You don't have to get the fancy or scientific words. Cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're ready for a couple of questions. I already answered one. So, mm -hmm. Kira, did Yay. you? Okay. Why did we had come in? So Brian wants to know. And not you, a viewer, Brian. <laughs> How do you desensitize desensitize a dog from a common household object? Whenever he cuts the grass, the weed eater, mower, whatever, drives his dog bear crazy. But he can't reassure him from where he is outside working in the yard. So the dog just continues to knock at the window. How can he fix that? Well, welcome to pairing. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and then also when I hear... My dog goes crazy. Sometimes it's predatory crazy. I mean, I want to go out there and chase that. Like Captain with the vacuum cleaner. Yes. Or when Dax, when I had the leaf blower, he bit the <laughs> end of it off. He wanted to kill it. And, and he did. He, he succeeded in killing it. It is a fearful thing. Is it an aggressive thing? Well, it really doesn't matter. You're, you're going to treat them both the same way. When it comes to stuff like that, you can either A, remove the dog, completely avoid the provocative event, which is Brian mowing the grass. So put them in a crate. Yeah, go put them up somewhere, whatever. Just remove them from the scene, put them away, and we don't have to worry about it. But again, with a dog's fine sense of uh, hearing, I don't know how big Brian's house is, but definitely in our house, you would not be able to put the dog anywhere that it didn't hear the, the leaf blower or the 
mower or whatever. But I will tell you this much. These are sight creatures. Animals learn with their eyes first, uh, the hearing a very distant third. By putting them up, they're not going to be as driven. You're not going to get the same sort of trigger that you would uh, if they were able to watch it. So that'd be one of my first choices to simply put the dog up in a safe place where he can't harm himself. But if you're going to desensitize, you're going to have to now do more in, intended pairing, meaning in natural, it's kind of like both of them. You're going to, it's more like counter conditioning. So the vacuum cleaners going or the lawnmowers going or the leaf blowers blowing, and something wonderful occurs during that time. We used to do that when I would compete in Schutzen and we had to get the dog over gunfire at a distance. Mm -hmm. And when I was a police officer, same thing. And we would take all these dogs are ball crazy. Well, guess what? We're going to fire that thing off a long ways away from here. So Brian, you could do the same thing. Uh, get the wife to mow the grass. <laughs> you, you can definitely do that while you desensitize the dog. I'm sensing a conspiracy here. <laughs> and you can take the dog down to about three houses down somewhere, just a, a, di a little bit of a distance away from your home. You know what I'm talking about? 50 yards or so. Play with your dog. Have a great time while this thing is going. Now I'm working more off of fear. I have some sort of anxiety when this is going. If it's just, oh, I want to get after it. Oh, man, I want to knock this window down. I want to get after it. That's called training. That's where you say, no, don't do that. Knock it off. Why don't you go lay down over here? Why don't you do place? Why don't you do this or that? But if it's any sort of fear, take your dog a distance away from it. Play with your dog. Reward your dog. Do some great exercises, uh, obedience work. Have a great time and slowly work your way back over a couple different mowings. And that should take care or alleviate some of the fear. You, you could also introduce a little bit of chemical, meaning like a CBD, cannabidiol, uh, to take the edge off the dog. That would certainly help during that time, and you wouldn't have to use it later on down the road. But again, if you can help me out, Brian, send me information letting me know, are we dealing with predatory-type drive here, or are we dealing with some sort of fear and anxiety? And, and if it is fear, after the leaf blower is no longer being used, how long does it take the dog to recover back? Because that's a huge part as far as understanding this, the severity of the dog's state of mind. Yeah. The higher you go up your, <clears throat> from your emotional column to your arousal column to the red zone, the closer you get to that red zone, mm -hmm. the longer it's going to take you to return to your baseline. And if it took a level 10 event like the lawnmower going to get me to the red zone, then while I am spiraling downward back to my baseline, however long that takes, minutes, hours, maybe a day or so, a level one event. In other words, someone cranking up their lawn more four houses down mm -hmm. can send the dog right back to that red zone. Um, so again, a little bit more information will help me with that, but it's only two, two different approaches, desensitized counter condition or flat out, hey, knock it off. We're just not going to do that. Uh, those would be the two approaches that you would take or, or avoidance. I, I can add that right. in there. Just put the darn dog up and see what kind of results you get from that. Gotcha. Hey, next hit me. Okay. So my trainer told me to ask family and friends to hand my aggressive dog a treat to help him overcome his aggression. Is, is that, that a good idea? Is it that easy? Why have we been doing it so wrong? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> For so long. Okay. Um, Okay, I know where the trainer's going. The trainer is trying to desensitize the dog to obviously some sort of signals the dog is picking up from unfamiliar people, causes it to be fearful. The dog's acting out on the fear, probably because it had to, meaning I had no other choice. I was on a leash. I was in a crate. I was in a car. I was in a tight four year, so on and so forth. So if flight's not an option, I pick fight. And if I pick fight and fight works, well, I'm a dog and dogs only carry one suitcase with them into the future with all future encounters. It's called success. Only humans carry losings or failures. So I can, I think I can just probably assume all of that. So now what the intended consequence was that if we hand the dog a treat, then the dog will assume that humans are vending machines and humans are good and therefore no longer be afraid. Great thinking the problem is the application is extremely dangerous. And the reason being is there are two imaginary zones around all mammals. There's a threat zone. The threat zone is me as a mammal. I see something, hear something, smell something. And I have paired that in the past with something dangerous. 
again, it's all up to me. My, I, my perception is internalized. I can perceive things any way I want to. So the dog does. So now the family comes over, the friend comes over, someone approaches, and the dog has made a previous pairing that that sign, that signal is danger, is a threat. That's my interpretation. Signal is a human. The interpretation is threat. The referent is, I've done this before. Okay, now, as the human starts to advance, most dogs will try to change the outcome. So they'll tempt something like growling, snarling, uh, standing very taunt. Uh, ears back, eyes become dilated, heart is racing a thousand miles an hour because their stress response has been mobilized. But they're going to try all these actions to achieve the outcome that they're looking for. And that's you not approaching any further. In fact, actually just turn around and leave. However, if you don't do that, then your approach will close the distance until finally you have entered the critical zone. And a critical zone for most dogs is if you can reach out and actually hand them a treat, oh, you're all in it. You've probably been in it already for a few feet. You are all in it. And let that dog be on the leash, which I hope it would be, just so you can kind of control the dog and just don't use these people as a bite test dummy. Yeah, now the dog has learned previously, leashes don't let me run. But you know what? When I growled at them or I bit them or I attacked them, they left. I influence the behavior of that human. So for me, I would rather see this. Stop at a distance of about six to eight feet away from the dog. Throw them a treat, underhanded, not overhanded. You're not trying out for a baseball team. An underhanded toss. Because then as we work our way in closer over a period of days or weeks or months, now the underhand motion of your body, that gesture equals that treat. Don't be surprised if the dog doesn't eat the treat initially, but it knows what it was. Maybe it doesn't want to eat it right now because I'm keeping my eyes on you. I don't have time to eat that. I need to, I need to pay attention to you. So I wouldn't be surprised and don't give up on it just because they don't eat the treat. They do know it was a treat. And then you go off and sit down or go do something else. But there's no way I'm going to have, if a dog, I've known a dog has bitten people or tried to bite people. There's zero chance I'm going to ask that human to now walk into the critical zone. That's how people get bitten all the time. In all the, the time. In those situations, I actually prefer the dog to approach the, the stranger at its own pace. So I'm not forcing it, not dragging it or anything like that. Um, but if, if the dog advances to, to that stranger, then it's developed some level of comfortability. Does that make sense? It, it's not going to, you know, if it's going to lash out, it's going to lash out right from the beginning. It's not going to, now if you make some sudden movements or address the dog all of a sudden, I can't tell you how many people trigger aggression because they look directly at the dog, they reach out, it's okay, or anything like that, and then the dog skyrockets. But if you just ignore the dog, let the dog figure you out first, and then offer a slow reward there, then you have a lot better chance than if you're just sit th sitting there approaching the dog. The dog doesn't have time to figure out whether you're a threat or not. So let's err on the side of caution and bite. Yeah. And some dogs will approach. I always tell everyone, you don't, you don't run to a gunfight. Right. Uh, right. So if they're approaching, <clears throat> however, when, in my experience, I've also noticed this. They approach. Remember, I learn with my eyes. So there's this foggy, misty, who, do I know you? Do, are you okay? I think something's saying, I'm a little conflicted here. Something's going, it's okay. That person's okay. But the other half of me is going, no, they're not. So I get a little closer. I want to examine you a little bit more. I want to see if I can catch a little whiff of you. And they get closer. So watch out for that because sometimes that's what it is. And then all of a sudden they get close enough and they go, Yep, I was right. It's a bad guy. And boom, and immediately they attack. <clears throat> Which is normally um, triggered by some sort of fast movement or some gesture or it's very, I mean, in my experience anyway, it's very rare that a human completely ignoring a dog who's just investigating, the dog ends up biting. Yeah, but what gesture do they have to do to give a treat? You have to bend over for right. most dogs. Right. When you do, you're now making your head closer to their head, which out in the wild signifies aggression right there by itself. You're usually over the dog, which right. now means, oh, you're looming over me. That's very scary. And you're reaching in my direction. Uh, I'm going to go for throwing the treat right. till the dog shows that gives me other signals that say, 
I'm good. I kind of like that person a little bit. And then the next time I'll have the person advance a little closer, throw the treat, a little bit closer, throw the treat, sit down, throw the treat. And no matter what, if I'm ever going to have someone give a dog a treat, they will be seated. Because uh, again, they learn with their eyes. A tall human is a more dangerous human than a three foot tall human. And they, just like we would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, some eight year old comes up to me and he's a black belt. I'm going to think, oh, whatever. But if a 28 year old who's six foot three comes up to me in a black belt, I'm going to go, I'm going to shoot you uh, from a distance. I'm going from the threat zone. I'm going to get you. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm going to do. That's how I would kind of handle that. Again, well, you have more questions, just reach out to us. We can also just completely avoid the, the treat giving anyways. That's my preferred route anyways. I don't really like strangers becoming treat dispensers for my dog. I would prefer my dog to engage with me when strangers are around and the reward come from me. And then the dog can desensitize to strangers in that way. So it's not always required that a stranger gives your dog a treat. No, no, absolutely not. In most cases, they're not even going to eat the treat right then right. as well. Okay. Anything else? We have time for another one. I think that was good. All right. I'm trying to teach my dog how to track people, but he keeps wanting to use his eyes instead of his nose. What am I doing wrong? Oh boy. Okay. A couple of things. Um, dogs do use their nose. They do track animals. You bet they do. They also use their eyes. That's why they have more rods than cones to detect movement at a great distance and low light. Uh, in case the little bunny's ears are moving, they can tell the difference between that and grass moving. So you're, you're going to work both of the senses in the animal. Me in the past, when I trained tracking, a couple things occurred. One, pairing. Here we go again. So we head out onto fresh grass. Make sure you're on fresh grass, meaning it's not been tracked on anytime soon. You're with a new dog. You're teaching your dog. And then we will walk across the grass naturally. People make the mistake of uh, scuffing their feet. Mm -hmm. When you do this, again, you're talking about an animal with over 2 million receptor cells in its nose. It could smell what gender you are, whether you're afraid, whether you're sad or angry or so on and so forth. When you scuff your feet across the grass, you break the grass blades, you unearth the dirt, and now the chlorophyll smell from the decaying grass, all the unearthed dirt, actually repels the animal. It's overwhelming. It's like you walking into a flower shop or a perfume shop and you go, oh God, this is killing me. Same thing with your dog. It will force your dog to raise its head. It doesn't want to have its nose down that close. So number one rule right off the bat, walk. Don't scuff the feet. Two, lay a treat in with your dog uh, on your footsteps along the way. Now, how do you put those treats? It's vitally important that you put the treat on the toe, not on the heel of the dog. Or if you can start at the beginning, the heel of where your foot step was and then the toe. And the reason for that is, think about it. A three-year-old becomes lost. She wanders off into the woods. So they bring in a, a tracking dog. The dog arrives on the scene. The dog starts to cast about looking for the child. It comes across the track left by the child. How does the dog know what direction to go? Do I go right back to the picnic table and now time is critical? Or do I turn and go the other way? We call it intersecting the T. And by placing your treats the way that I just told you, the dog will learn soon that the walk, our heels hit heavier than the ball of our feet. The dog will soon learn track from heel to toe. So in the beginning, I may put a treat in both the heel and toe, but eventually it's only in the toe. Then of course, now it's down to maybe every 10th or 12th step. And then finally, there's no more treats left on the track at all, but there's a nice reward at the end of the track uh, called a hidden ball. Never put anything at the end of your track that the dog can see from 50 feet away. And there's still 50 feet of track left because that's what they'll do. They'll raise their head and they see it and they just immediately go to it. That's what I do. Why would yeah. I bother to have my nose on the ground? So the, the biggest mistakes I see is scuffing the feet. Don't do that. Put your treats heel to toe, then eventually just on the toe. Uh, make sure that you don't allow your dog to wander too far off the track. I control them. You're allowed to go sniff undisturbed grass and go, hmm, that smells like natural grass. Then all of a sudden, there's this impression here. This grass smells differently. That's the track. Then on the other side, natural, disturbed, natural, disturbed, natural, disturbed. And guess what's in the disturbed stuff? Treats. 
cool, sweet. I'm going to keep my nose down because I can't see those. Make sure you use treats that they can't see. Something brown or whatever, not some bright yellow like cheese, Cheez-Its or something <laughs> that you have out there. Don't use those. And if you do this and take your time, go slowly with this. Be patient. Tracking requires patience. But one of my favorite things to train a dog to do, mm -hmm. guarantee you'll get it done. Also, if you can control this, try to put the wind to your back because this is going to to push your dog's nose more towards the ground yep. so that sense not being pushed up in their face. So yeah. try to try to put the wind at your back. Yeah. Otherwise, the wind will come up and up it comes yep. in too much. You know, it's almost like the old adage, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. And that's what's happening. It's too much smell. And it becomes more of an aerial search than a track. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, we could spend it. You know what? We could spend half of an episode just talking about tracking, and maybe we will. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, that that'd, be really that'd be fun. really fun. Really interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating talking about the earth exhaling and inhaling yeah. and so on and so forth. There's so much involved in. I love how tracking. you track in the winter versus how you track in the summer. It's, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. All right, guys, we're going to have to bring this show to a close. I hope you picked up some good information in it. I know I enjoyed it. Uh, check us out at tamingthewild.com. What's our YouTube page here? Uh, it's Taming the Wild, and it's just uh, Taming with a capital All Wild. Yeah, that's because we our wild stands mm -hmm. out. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Amen. All right, guys, you have any questions, send them to us this week. We'll get on to it next week. Next week, I want to talk about Alpha Roll, R-O-L-L, -L, or Alpha Roll, R-O-L-E. What's the difference? Are, are either one of them any good? We're going to talk about that next week and a whole bunch of more questions we get to answer. We've already got three. All yep. right, sweet. Can't wait till next week. You guys have a wonderful week. We'll see you then. Thank you. All right. All right. For you, those of you tuning in live, we certainly enjoyed it. Um, Appreciate you. I think it in worked there. this week. I think it actually worked. <laughs> I think we we may have worked out the bugs and all the technical issues that we were having with you know, hardwired now and everything else and direct hookup from Josh's computer into the camera. You Hopefully got it done. Yeah. If you're a real wizard on this kind of stuff, you, you, you sleep with a camcorder, anything like that, let us know. Cause we'd be glad to have your help with that. We got a new subscriber on YouTube through streaming live. So thank you for subscribing. Yes. We appreciate it. Okay, cool stuff to come. All right. Cool. Gonna, See you guys. Have a great week now.